This is Out of the Box with your host, Jonathan Clark. Out of the Box, Sunday nights at 9 on Q1043. Hey, welcome back. Jonathan Clark. We're in the studio with a guy you know as a singer, a songwriter, a punk pioneer from his band, uh, a little band uh, from the UK called the Sex Pistols. Uh, he's got a new album right here. It's called Good to Go. And uh, he's playing Joe's Pub here in Manhattan, uh, New York City, tomorrow night, Tuesday night. All the tour dates and the info at glennmatlock.com. And here he is, the man himself. Good afternoon. It's glennmatlock.co.uk. D- glennmatlock.co.uk. Yeah. I always forget to do that. I'm sorry. That's all right, because somebody nicked my glennmatlock.com. What are they doing with it? I don't know. <laughs> uh, the new album has you and some other familiar names on it. Earl Slick on guitar. Earl Slick. Have goes, you known Earl a long time? I've known him for about eight years now. Right. I um, met him. I was doing a little session with Clem Burke and this English friend of mine who lives over is a fashion designer who sings a bit. Uh-huh. And um, Elle contacted him via, I think it's MySpace back then. And this my guy, God. This guy, Keenan, called me up. He said, this guy's written to me. He said, you know, he likes my stuff. What should I do? I said, who is it? And he said, Elle Slick. I said, well, do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the guy and, can play a little bit, yeah. right? Yeah. And I said, if you're going to do it, I'll come over and play bass on it with Clem, which is what we did. So I met El. And then, as time goes by, we got on all right. Um, I was thinking about doing this album, and I asked Slim Jim Phantom if he'd drum on it. Stray Cats. And I said, any ideas for a guitarist? And he said, how about Earl Slick? And I didn't know he knew him. but And it just all kind of sort of fell into place, really. So uh, Now, are you playing bass on the album or just guitar? I just I think I played bass on one track. I okay. I played guitar. My friend... Um, Jim Lowe plays bass on <clears> the <throat> album. Jim's like a record producer. He does all the stereophonic stuff and right. charlatans back oh, in the wow. UK. Okay. Got big, and he's got a Grammy for doing a jazz album with um, Billy Cobham and Al Dimiola and wow. Jeff Beck or something. Those like guys that. can play. Yeah. Jeez. So he knows what he's doing, but he's yeah. quite happy to play the bass lines that I suggest. <laughs> so I can concentrate on strumming and singing. New this York, thing. LA, Nashville. Where did you record this? I know it was in America, right? Rhinebeck. Upstate New York. Oh, upstate New York. Okay. Yep. So, well, um, what time of year was that? It was, <clears throat> it was snowy one morning. Oh, okay. So it was, it was winter quite time. quite nice the next. I remember when it was snowy, I went downstairs to get some coffee. I just got off the plane, and nobody gave me the code to go into the other building where oh, no. you make the coffee. So I'm sitting there, and a deer walked past me. <laughs> so it was quite kind of... Uh, very cool. Yeah. Uh, was it your uncle that first showed you a Fender jazz bass? Is that is that how the story goes? Yeah. Where did you get this info from? I don't know, man. I man. just found it. You know, the internet's a beautiful, crazy, scary yeah. thing. Uncle Colin ducked and dived a little bit, and he, when I was about ten, he came back with this big case, and I said, "What's in that?" And he opened it up, and it was a tortoise shell. Oh, Fender tortoise shell. No, not tortoise shell. Um, sunburst with a tortoise shell pick oh, guard. Okay. And I said, where'd you get that? He said, don't ask. And I never saw it again. Oh, really? You know, the next day, it had gone. But and from that moment, you were... It must have sown the seeds. You know? Enthralled. Yeah. Um, and so, but but back then, you were hearing a lot of Motown, right? I mean, was the Motown, like the bass lines in the Motown songs that really... Uh, pretty pretty much. When, you know, 10, 11 years old, we had the best TV program in the world, I think, called Ready, Steady, Go. Right, yeah. And that was when bands like the Kinks and the Arbos and the Who and the Small Face had come through. But also on the show was a girl called Dusty Springfield, yes. who'd been going backwards and forwards to the States and kind of intro- in- insisted on having like Smokey Robinson and Diana Ross and Supremes and all Sam Cooke. They would play live on this program. So, yeah. That was the birth of the Motown thing. Now, you know, one wouldn't think that, the, you know, your formative years, you're listening to Motown and you're hearing these great bass lines and watching that show, that would not lead you towards the Sex Pistols necessarily. It's kind of a, bands tend to be a culmination of a lot of happenstance. Yeah. Right? Just meeting the right people at the right time and you go off on that kind of path. But in the Pistols, there's a, a very rich broth of stuff going on. Of course there is, yeah. Know, underneath the racket. Um, but Paul was in a Tamla Motown. Um, yeah, marbles and all. There's right, the rhythm section. I think a lot of it was there was a in London there was a a kind of um, a little chain of discotheques, right? And um, the Bird's Nest they were called, and everybody used to go there. And the girls would drink Perno and black currant juice, and the guys would drink Snake Bite, which is half a lager and half a cider, 
with a little shot of black currant in it, and everything was kind of black. And you have a few of them, the treble on your ears go, and all I could hear was the Tamla bass line. Right, yeah, the bass yeah. Line sort of pumping through. So, but you always liked guitar too, though, right? I well, mean, the I'd, whole time. I started off playing the guitar. Yeah, Every yeah. Every song I've ever been involved in has started life on an acoustic guitar, and the bass guitar bit is just to kind of enable the band project. Yeah, know? and I enjoy playing bass, but I enjoy playing bass when somebody else is singing because right. it's. You know, something has to give with it. When you're playing guitar, you can go, I've got one here, look. Right. The yeah. listeners can't hear me, but I'm pointing. You know, you can put on a bit more of a show, but it's bass, you've got to kind of, <laughs> yeah. it's important, you know. Yeah. You know, the Keith Richards or the, uh, who, who and Pete Townsend got it from Keith Richards, the whole sort of like windmill thing. Yeah. Um, that's fascinating. I, and while you were playing bass and, and sort of into that bass and uh, the instrument and everything, were there certain bass players that you sort of looked up to and were like, oh, my God, how did he do that? And he's so great. Or do you have, like, a list of, like, your favorite? There's, yeah, there's a few. I think the top <clears> of the list for me is going back to this Ready Steady Go show, the small face was on a lot, and I really dug Ronnie Lane, you know, who was within the band, and it was a little bit different kind of somehow. Um, I like Hank Whistle, fantastic, early McCartney. But then I like... You know, Carol Kay and James Jameson's bass Oh, players. my God, yeah. But then there's some weirdos in there. I really like um, Klaus Foreman who's a bass player. Right, like, yeah. On that Plastic Ono band, you know, John Lennon's first solo record. That's kind of whacked out. I like Holger Kuzko from, however you pronounce it, the guy from Cannes. Yeah. There's some good people out there. There is, um, you've heard of the band Rush and obviously Getty Lee, uh, uh, a world-class bass player. He recently released... My Big Beautiful Book of Bass. Oh, okay. And featuring his whole collection and interviews with people like John Paul Jones. And, uh, well, he didn't get to interview Chris Squire, obviously. Uh, but a fascinating book. I, I highly recommend you check okay, it out. I'll, I'll look out for that one. Well, you've got a beautiful guitar with you. You want to play us a live song? Yeah, I will, if I don't keep that in the thing. I'm going to do a Tell song. us the name of this one and then just uh, well, go for it. This song's sort of kind of one of the singles from my Good To Go album. And... It's called Keep On Pushing. You ready? Ready. You gotta say go. Ready, steady, go.
goes, wow. That is Glenn Metlock playing live here on Q104.3's Out of the Box. His new album's called Good to Go, and he's playing Joe's Pub here in New York City tomorrow night, Tuesday night in Manhattan. And you can get all the tour dates and all the info on Glenn at glennmatlock.co.uk. Uh, tell me about uh, joining the Faces in, what, 2010? Were you, like, really excited about that then? Well, I that, mean, of course I was excited. It was the band that... I used to stand in front of the mirror when I was 13 and right. play the guitar. Who, were you, who, who did you want to be in the faces? Ronnie Lane. Ronnie bass, Lane. The bass player. Right? The great right. Ronnie Lane, yeah. But as years went by, um, we was doing the Rich Kids album and we needed piano on a track. And Mick Ronson was the record producer who oh plays boy. piano a little bit. Yeah. And the track needed some rock and roll piano. And um, he's having a go at it. And I said, that's, mate, you know, you're really good, but that's not the right kind of thing. He said, well, do you want I said, more rock and roll. And he said, well, like Jerry Lee Lewis. I said, no, like kind of Ian McLagan, right? And he went, well, I don't really play like that. <laughs> and the engineer said, Ian McLagan was down here two days ago. I got his phone number. So we said, let's call him up. And we called him up and he came down the next day. Oh, man. And me and him got on great. He played on the track. And then he did a tour with us with the rich kids. So I was really chuffed about that. Oh, my God. I can imagine. And we became quite good friends. But then he moved <clears throat> to America, to Austin. Yes. And um, I lost touch with him. And then I heard him on the radio show in England. It was like a round table program. It was like a local London station. And I know the guys there. So I called up the station. And I said, give Matt my phone number. You know, get him to call me. And I was driving out of town and I was going to a place called the Isle of Wight and I'm on the ferry and the phone rang and it was Matt. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going to the Isle of Wight, but I'm coming back in a couple of days. Do you want to meet up for a coffee? So we did. And we chatted and what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm doing this, that and the other. I did some stuff with Dylan and I'm just, Springsteen keeps asking me to do <laughs> stuff. And, I, and he sort of turned his nose up a little bit. And I said, well, what do you really want to do? He said, I want to reform the faces. And I said, listen, and poor old Ronnie Lane had passed away by then. Yeah. And I said, listen, you know that I know that you know that I'm the right guy for the job to put a word in for me. And he did. And it didn't happen immediately. It took a couple of years to get together. And we didn't do that many shows because Ronnie would get a phone call from the Rolling Stones, so you can't really argue with that. Yeah. But I got the gig. But then, just before he was about to start rehearsing, he said, Sh Glenn, you sure you're up for this? And I said, Matt, I know those songs backwards. And he went, oh, great. I said, it's just forwards that I, I struggle with. <laughs> and he laughed. And that's their kind of sense of humor. So that was kind of cool. Oh, man, so good. I think it's amazing that you were in the Sex Pistols, then you were out of the Sex Pistols, then you were in the Sex Pistols again, and then did more shows that's than wrong, any it? of them ever. And got, and got paid more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was like five reunion shows, right? Pretty much. Five amazing. tours. Something like that, if my research is correct. Something like that, yeah. But spread out over a while. The first one we did in 96 was a big one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, about 100 shows around the world. So I think I saw, I saw one of those shows uh, at the Roseland Ballroom here in New York City. Oh, well, do you know that gig, right? When we was playing, we did, I think we did two nights there, actually. Right, I think you did, yeah. And normally, on my side of the stage was the on-stage monitors, but... For some reason, the stage was set up different, and everything was on Steve Jones' side of the stage. And there was supposed to be nobody on my side of the stage, but I could see two people in the gloom behind the PA speakers, and I thought, this ain't kind of right. So we finished the number, and I went to have a look, and sure enough, there's two people there. Dennis Hopper and Uma Thurman. Come on! And she gave me a kiss on the cheek. <laughs> <laughs> it was for a couple of days. Uh, I was a teenage sex pistol. Tell me about writing that book, the whole experience of it. And uh, your, the reaction that you got when you uh, published it? Um, reaction that I got? Well, I'm still getting some kind of reaction. People say, oh, I, I didn't realize it was like that. It's kind of lighthearted, but it's a bit pointed in things. I think all of us in the band had different kind of takes on, you know, it was a big chunk of our, our, our lives. I found it a very cathartic experience to... Yeah. How long did it take you? Oh, about five minutes. No. <laughs> Wait, did you write stuff down? Did you keep a journal back in the no, day? Like, no, no. It was. I, I, I did it with a not a ghostwriter, but a mate of mine. It was a journalist for Sounds magazine, and originally it was written in the days before word processors. So it's been out mm. quite a long while. It's in its fifth or sixth edition now. Oh wow! I have and, to get like, that. And I've updated it a bit, but you know, there's certain things you have to talk about, and I was kind of prompted to talk about 
you know, the story behind the story, even the story behind the story behind the story. Right, yeah, something. yeah, exactly. So we'll have to sort you out with a copy um, of that. But you can still get it online. It's an e-book. Yeah, know? yeah. Um, do you guys talk? I mean, do you? I know, Paul, you talk to Paul, right? I mean, Yeah, but we've never really spoken. Oh, really? Not in a meaningful man to man right, kind yeah. of way, which is our kind of problem, really. Yeah. But um, yeah, we talk, you know. Steve. See Paul every now and John. then. John. Well, John and Steve live in America. I live in England most of the time. Right, um, yeah. The last time I was in L.A., I saw Steve. We went to the opening of a new jean shop. <laughs> Well, both of us, and Steve's the king of this, is to get free swag. <laughs> yeah, he's good at that, right? Good. Well, you know. Uh, his name I'm, is Glenn. I'm, I'm following him up behind quite. <laughs> Glenn Matlock is his name. Everyone go out and get the new album. It's called Good to Go. And see him on tour. You can get all the tour dates at glennmatlock.co.uk. Playing Joe's Pub here in New York City tomorrow night, Tuesday night in Manhattan. Uh, get your tickets now. Glenn, a pleasure to meet you. Thanks and, for having us in. And uh, I got to get the book and I want to hear more stories. So please come back uh, whenever you're in uh, Tribeca, I'll, I'll Lower will, Manhattan. I will hold you to that. Thank you, sir. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. This is Out of the Box with your host, Jonathan Clark. Out of the Box, Sunday nights at 9 on Q1043.